Coming up on Diplomatic Channel, North and South Korea agree to march under a unified Korea flag at next month's Winter Olympics in the South. U.S. President Donald Trump marks his first year in office amid a government shutdown. And the European Union says it is still open to a change of heart from the United Kingdom regarding Brexit. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Temi Tokwe Fagbimi. We begin in Asia, where North and South Korea have agreed to march together under a single unified Korea flag at next month's Winter Olympics in the South. They also agreed to field a joint women's ice hockey team after rear talks at the Chus village of Panmunjom. They were the first high-level talks between the two Koreas in more than two years. After a new round of talks, the two Koreas agreed not only to march together, but field players from both sides at next month's Winter Games. The South Korean government likely saw that as a diplomatic win, but what they didn't expect is outrage from their own country. Thousands of South Koreans went online to express their distaste for the decision, even calling the upcoming Games the Pyongyang Olympics. The Korean Peninsula flag is not our national flag. We are the ones hosting the Olympics, so our athletes should hold the South Korean flag at the Games. This points to a sea change in South Korean attitude towards their northern neighbors. The younger generation has fewer cross-border ties and see the North as separate. And after Seoul working for over a decade to secure the Games, they also say they don't want Pyongyang stealing the spotlight. South Korea managed to host the Pyeongchang Olympics with great difficulty on their third try. It will be difficult to get the people's support if it's degraded the Pyongyang Olympics. Meanwhile, during the visit to a Japanese military training camp, Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull says there must be no let-up in economic and diplomatic pressure on North Korea, despite recent evidence that Pyongyang may be seeking to improve relations. Well, the, the signal to North Korea is one of absolute solidarity between Australia, uh, Japan, the United States and China and indeed the rest of the global community in continuing to impose strong economic sanctions. We have to maintain those sanctions. That is the only way we will achieve uh, the, the, the bringing of this uh, reckless and rogue regime back to its senses. And PM Abe and I are absolutely of the same mind on that. Earlier, the U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said the United States is receiving evidence that international sanctions are really starting to hurt North Korea. Pressure, he says, has encouraged Pyongyang to hold talks with South Korea for the first time in two years. He also praised China for its efforts in putting pressure on Pyongyang. But the Chinese have leaned in hard on the North Koreans. Uh, to the point, uh, part of this uh, approach was to help the Chinese come to the realizations that North Korea, for the last 50, 60 years, may have been an asset to you. They're now a liability to you. So we're getting a lot of evidence that these sanctions are really starting to hurt. This comes after a 20-nation meeting in North Korea agreed on January the 16th to consider imposing unilateral sanctions on Pyongyang that go beyond those required by UN Security Council resolutions. While many have welcomed the reduction in tensions on the Korean Peninsula, some in Seoul and Washington have questioned whether South Korea is giving up too much for too little. We ask our guest on the program, Dr. David Awurawu, a senior lecturer of history and strategic studies at the University of Lagos, his view on this issue. Thanks for coming on Diplomatic Channel. Thank you. Now, what is the significance of North and South Korea agreeing to march under a unified flag at the Winter Olympics next month? Very, very significant. You know that in the past one year, 18 months or so, uh, North Korea has been testing all sorts of uh, ballistic missiles. The latest being the intercontinental ballistic missile, which was tested, and there was apprehension across the world. And, you know, in the past uh, a couple of months, that these tests have escalated. 
um, tension, you know, rose to its highest level, and bilateral talks between North and South Korea collapsed. So starting talks again after two years signifies a reduction of tension. And of course, since the, the talks began, we haven't had tests again from North Korea. So all of this together, you know, uh, makes uh, the, the talks uh, very, very significant. But there are fears that North Korea might just be playing for time so as to continue with its nuclear program. Do you see this friendly overture from Pyongyang lasting beyond the Winter Olympics? I think so. I think it will last beyond the Winter Olympics. Um, it is true that North Korea might be, you know, playing for time while it's developing its nuclear weapons and yet it's uh, pretending to be, you know, negotiating. But when you look at, you know, the way the talks, you know, the idea was mooted, the whole process started, it seems that, you know, there is some genuine commitment to, you know, diplomacy on the path of the North Korean leader. And uh, it also appears as if the North, Co North Korea is feeling the sanctions more intensely. And then another reason, North Korea wants to isolate the United States as much as possible. So when you look at the combination of forces and factors that have given rise to this, I think the, 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 the talks will you know, last beyond the winter. So could it lead to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula? That is more complicated. Uh, North Korea, I do not see North Korea um, you know, granting that you know, concession or being willing to uh, give up his nuclear program. That is where, you know, disagreements would occur. Uh, the demand, the request that North Korea should 